Hello, everyone. Uh, we are just getting going to get started in a moment. Uh, oh, no, I didn't hit start. OK, now we've really started. All right, I hit the wrong button. Uh, we will be getting started in a moment, everyone. Uh, we'll wait for everyone to, to populate the list. If you are looking for the webinar on the manuscript heritage of Artsakh and Udik, you have come to the right Zoom place. Uh, we will be getting started in just one minute or so. Arasanjan has raised his hand. I hope you're just waving hello. Uh, Ara, hello. We'll get that slideshow back up in a moment. So let me uh, just begin by saying good afternoon. Uh, it's afternoon here at least. My name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs for the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser in Belmont, Massachusetts. And I hope wherever you are, it is a bearable temperature for you. It's rather hot here. And I gather in Yerevan as well. Uh, on behalf of Nasser and the Matanadran, AKA the Mesrov Mashtots Institute of Ancient Manuscripts in Yerevan. And on behalf of our co-sponsor of today's program, the AGBU New England District, thank you for joining us on Zoom or on YouTube and welcome to today's webinar on the manuscript tradition of Artsakh and Utik with Dr. Vahan Terkovondian, the director of the Matanadaran. This event is the second of what we intend and hope to be an ongoing, in fact, we hope an unending, series of joint Nasser and Matanadaran public programs, the first having taken place in March of this year with the Matanadaran's outstanding senior international relations specialist, Sona Baloyan, from whom we will hear presently, who gave an overview of the Matanadaran and its amazing holdings and projects. Um, among those projects, which I believe Sona mentioned at that time, is the new publication, Manuscript Heritage of Artsakh and Uti, co-authored by Dr. Hravard Hakopian, Dr. Tamara Minasian, and Dr. Vahe Tarosian. The publication was made possible by a grant from the Lawrence Terzian Fund of the AGBU. And I would like to now ask uh, Sona to say a few words uh, on today as well. Sona. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much for organizing our uh, second presentation within the framework of our collaboration. We're very happy that this uh, keeping to continue and I'm sure that in the future we will have more and more interesting lectures together. As you've already mentioned uh, today, uh, Dr. Vahan Tarhevondian will introduce you the book, uh, which is I'm holding in my hands, Manuscript Heritage of Artsakh and Dutik, um, which was uh, published just two months ago. And it's a very monumental work with which we want to speak about the true facts, um, introducing both historical facts, um, artistic peculiarities of this manuscript heritage from Artsakh and Dutik, and also about all the scriptoria and the heritage created there. Um, Dr. Vahan Terhevondian will introduce you in detail and will focus more on historical aspects as a historian. And uh, of course, I'm sure that we will have many questions in the end of the session and we'll be happy to answer them. Sona, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, please, uh, those of you uh, watching on Zoom uh, during the presentation, as you have questions, please uh, 
use the Zoom Q&A function to submit them and following the, the presentation and, and discussion between Dr. Dergovonian and myself, we will uh, address as many of the audience questions as, as time allows. Uh, as Sona said, we will today get an outline uh, of this important volume from Dr. Tervavondian, uh, and, and then we will have a, a bit of a discussion. And since I have no doubt that some of you in the audience will be interested in getting a copy of the book uh, for yourselves, uh, I should say that at this moment, the book can be purchased from the Matanadaran directly, and it is my hope, and I believe it will almost certainly happen, that uh, we will have copies available in the Nasser bookstore next month uh, for, for purchase by, by anyone who is interested. The subject of the book to be discussed and presented today is, is one that lies at the intersection of, among other things, history, art, religion, and current day politics. And intersection may be the wrong word, since they don't merely come together uh, and then separate again, as, as roads might do. Rather, they cannot be unlinked or separated from each other, really. Um, Nasser, for example, does a regular series of programs billed as uh, contemporary topics, whereas other programs we do might be considered to be historical in nature or cultural or what have you. Uh, but anyone who understands anything about either history or culture or contemporary issues uh, will realize how arbitrary these distinctions can sometimes be. Uh, and I think nowhere do we see this more uh, clearly than, than in, in the type of topic we're going to have uh, talked about today. With the future of, of Artsakh itself in, in grave doubt, so too its past is in grave doubt, or at least a, every attempt is being made to cast it in grave doubt. Uh, history is constantly being written and rewritten by scholars. That is not in itself an issue and it's not in itself a bad thing. Sometimes history is rewritten because new sources arise or new theoretical approaches call for new uh, ways of approaching history. And sometimes it is rewritten to suit contemporary political needs. This is not unique to Artsakh, nor is it unique to the South Caucasus, obviously. Uh, but we have seen it happening in this area with a vengeance, so to speak, in recent years and in recent decades. This is not the moment to go too deeply into this topic, which is itself a, a huge one, uh, and, and was in fact the subject of a conference uh, earlier this year that was organized by Professor Aslanian of UCLA, and of which Nasser was a co-sponsor uh, entitled, Is the Pen Mightier Than the Sword? Historians Disputed Ownership of History and Ethnic Conflict in the South Caucasus. But for now, uh, I, suffice it to say that since the 1930s, when Stalin decreed that each Soviet Republic had to have its own distinct national history, with, which emphasized its primordial existence in its current lands, whether or not that squared with his historical facts, uh, Azerbaijani historians have been remarkably fluid in their approach. And if the tracing of Azerbaijan's eth ethnogenesis to the Medes or the Caucasian Albanians or other groups from antiquity was a product of Stalin's nationalities policies, when there was a need to shield Azerbaijan from pan-Turkism, it took flight in the post-Stalin era thanks to Bunyatov and his followers and accelerated in the post-1988 period and remains alive and well today. Nowadays, there seems to be no contradiction between Azerbaijan on the one hand, continuing to assert a sort of inherent Caucasian Albanian identity uh, with the, a newly discovered interest in the Udis as evidence of this, while at the same time proclaiming that Azerbaijan and Turkey are one nation and two states. And at the same time, also asserting that Armenians living in Artsakh, if not those living in the Armenian Republic, are in fact some kind of crypto Albanians, and that any so called Armenian monuments in Karabakh are actually Albanian. And in fact, not also in Armenia or in Artsakh, but even as far into Western Armenia as Akhtamar in Lake Van, to which an Udi delegation traveled in 2019 to symbolically reclaim the Church of the Holy Cross. 
We're grateful to such scholars as the late Samvel Karapetyan, Dr. Hamlet Petrosian, and many others, including the authors and editors of this new book, The Manuscript Heritage of Artsakh and Utik, and to our speaker today, Dr. Terhovondian, for their heroic efforts to document, study, and preserve this rich history, and to do so with scholarly integrity. Dr. Vahan Tergavondian has served as the director of the Matanadaran since 2018, having been the acting director, director since 2016. He is the author of numerous publications, including uh, uh, the Armenian, Cilician Armenian King Kingdoms uh, and the uh, Arab countries of, in the Near East, uh, Kilikian, Hayastan, Hayastaniev, Ayubian, Petu Tunera, uh, Cilician Armenian and the Ayubid states, and he is the co-editor of Catalog of the Quran Manuscripts of the Matanadaran, as I say, among many other publications. Please welcome him and please remember to use the Zoom Q&A function to pose your questions to Dr. Tergovanyan. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours, Dr. Tergovanyan. I will share screen with the slideshow. Good evening or good morning, maybe, for many of you, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues. <clears throat> so the uh, presented album book was published two months ago. This book was compiled and published with the very purpose of preserving and protecting the cultural heritage of Artsakh and Utik, and above all, keeping it away from all kinds of di distortions and misappropriations. We had an idea to have such a publication long time ago, but after the last Artsakh war, we were convinced uh, that the publication of the book is very urgent. Fortunately, our purpose coincided with the goal of the research grants on Artsakh announced by AGBU. Thus, with the joint efforts of the two institutions, the book was published. The manuscript heritage of Artsakh and Utik is the result of successful teamwork with the participation of around a dozen specialists. From the very beginning, our approach has been as follows. Taking as a basis the historical, codicological, philological, and art historical studies carried out, especially during the last 30, 40 years, to create a comprehensive work which by its nature would occupy an intermediate position between a profound scholarly work and a popular book. That is, while having an appropriate source-based study to have an easily readable book that would be interesting to general public and would also fulfill a certain propaganda role. In other words, it is intended not only for researchers and academic circles, but also for diplomats, politicians, and general public, especially foreigners. I would like to thank the three authors, historian Vahe Torosyan, philologist Tamara Minasyan, and art historian Ravard Hakopyan, whose joint work has produced a good result. Editor Karen Matevosyan, translator Sona Baloyan, proofreader of the English text Erin Pignon, as well as the Mashtots Foundation headed by Varti Keshishan, who coordinated the work, also made a serious contribution. I would also like to mention the designer, Mardiros Dolmajan and the cartographer, Geram Badalian. The latter created a new map, precisely showing the location of many scriptoria the centers where hundreds of valuable manuscripts were produced. These two provinces of historical Armenia are presented together for several reasons. First of all, the history of these provinces had many in common in the ancient and middle ages. The second reason is that being a constituent part of the medieval Armenian manuscript art and miniature painting, Artsakh Utik formed a separate school and had its own local characteristics, just as the manuscripts of Vasturakan, Anishirak, Upper Armenia, Sunik or Cilicia had their own characteristics. Finally, these two neighboring regions are also 
united by their bitter fate in the sense that in the last hundred years, despite the constant struggle for national identity, they were not included in the Armenian state, but against their will, they were joined to the artificial, artificially created Turkic state in 1918, constantly being under the threat of extin uh, extinction. In this regard, there are two exceptions. One part of Utik, today's Tavush province, which has been preserved as part of the Republic of Armenia, and what remained after the war of 2020 from the unrecognized Republic of Artsakh. The book is also an attempt to sound the alarm and save a huge cultural layer situated on the vast territory of the Kura Araxes Mesopotamia that is in imminent danger of destruction. Is the policy of falsifying history and appropriating the culture of other peoples new in the neighboring country. In fact, it is de uh, decades old, uh, especially uh, the 50s, 60s of the last century. There were such authors in that country, some of whom had important posts and academic titles. But in general, that tendency was marginalized under Soviet conditions. <clears throat> Meanwhile, after the declaration of independence of Azerbaijan, it actually became state policy. And after the last Artsakh war, we can say that it has reached its peak. An aggressive state organized policy involving all govern government agencies, embassies, and many support groups is being implemented with millions of dollars being provided. Distortion of the past is an integral part of anti-Armenian propaganda, which proceeds in two main directions. Either to push Armenians and their culture out of the region by simply physically destroying it, the most vivid example of which was the destruction of thousands of Hachkars, crossstones of Juva of, or Julfa, just 15, 20 years ago, or to declare all churches, crosstones, monasteries, or the authors who worked there and all their works as Albanian or Caucasian Albanian. In other words, either destroy or distort. However, it is not enough to just say that what was done is a falsification of history, distortion, etc. The political and cultural history of ancient and medieval period, especially in our region, has many complex and intricate layers, which are generally understandable to serious scholars whose works are based on facts, even if they have some disagreements. However, if one resorts to manipulations for political purposes, they can easily confuse the un uninformed by the deliberate selection of these same facts. Let us briefly refer to an important issue here. What does Arvank mean? Of course, tribes speaking Caucasian languages lived on the territory in between Caucasus Mountains and Kura River. On that territory, they formed a state, a kingdom, but they never managed to form a united nation speaking the same language. This is evidenced by the, the, the ancient authors reporting about 26 tribes who spoke different languages that were barely understandable to each other. This is all also evidenced by some Arab authors of the 9th, 10th centuries who report on more than 70 tribes who again had difficulty communicating with each other due to speaking different languages. In general, a great division in terms of language and ethnicity is specific to the Caucasus region. Nowadays, Dagestan can be mentioned as an example. There is a sufficiently accepted view that the name Arvank derives from the word Aru, meaning favorable, mild, pleasant, or fruitful in Armenian. It is used in some uh, dialects. Thus, Arvank means a favorable, fertile land and it does not have to have an ethnic meaning. 
As for the name Albania given by the Greek and Roman authors, then this is just an example of assigning a newly discovered country a familiar country name. In the case of both Arvank and Birk, the names of European Albania and Iberia were arti artificially attributed to our neighboring countries by finding some sound similarity. <clears throat> it makes no sense to go into the depth. No, it's okay, the previous one. <clears throat> Please, the pre yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you, oh, sorry, sorry, you can go to the next one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it makes no sense to go into the depths of the millennia in this short speech. Let's try to understand what were the political, ethnic, and cultural borders in the region. Without referring to the kingdom of Urartu nor to the Yerevanduni or Orontid kingdom, let's choose the second century BC as a starting point. When freed from uh, the Seleucid rule, the Artaxiad kingdom of Armenia was proclaimed. The testimony of a number of famous ancient authors, Herodotus, Ptolemaeus, Pliny, and others, states that the northeastern border of Greater Armenia passed through the Kura River. And the country called Arvan, Albania, or Caucasian Albania, spread on the left bank of the Kura River. Whereas on the right bank was Utik province, further down was Artsakh, which were an integral part of the Armenian kingdom. This situation continued almost unchanged until the mid fifth century. That is for about six and a half centuries. In other words, throughout the reigns of the Artaxiad and Arsakid dynasties of Armenia, the Kura river remained as a border between Armenia and Arvan. Things started to change in the fifth century. First in 428, the Arsagid kingdom of Armenia disappeared. In uh, Virk or in uh, Iberia and Arvan, Caucasian Albania, although there remained nominally kings for a short period of time, they had completely lost their sovereignty. In the middle of that same century, the Sassanids undertook new administrative divisions, creating Marspanates in the region under their control. Even without the Byzantine part, Armenia occupied a much larger territory than Birk and Arvan. In addition, the Armenian Arsak dynasty had always been a headache for Sassanid Iran and needed to be weakened once and for all. Who is the next one? Finally, in order to conduct the Iranian tax enforcement more organized, it was desirable to have almost equal territorial units that would pay approximately the same amount of tax. That is why the Sassanids annexed the Gugar province of Armenia to Virk, while Artsakh and Utik were annexed to Arvank, which the Persians were calling Aram. This is how the Marspanates of Armenia, Birk and Arvan or Aran were formed, all three with changed borders, but their ethnic composition did not change from that. You can see here the changed borders, how Birk and Arvan became much larger and Armenia smaller. However, uh, there is an important circumstance that must be mentioned here. Along with the expansion of the administrative boundaries of Arvank, the area under the jurisdiction of the Church of Arvank was expanded to the same extent, that is Artsakh and Utik were con considered subordinate to the Church of Arvank. It should be noted that the Church of Arvank uh, followed the Armenian Church from very beginning, confessionally, from the very day of its creation, and most likely the language of the divine service was also Armenian. The Catholic state of Arvank was included in the patriarchal system of the Armenian church and was subordinate to the Armenian Catholics. 
As is known, no comp complete work created in the so-called Caucasian Albania script has come down to us. There are only some fragments. This is the reason that passing under the authority of the church of Arvan did not cause any opposition in Armenian population of Artsakh and Utik. Uh, the next, please. <clears throat> The above mentioned three Marspanates remained within the mentioned boundaries for about two centuries until the Arab invasions began. When the Arab Caliphate completely took control over our region, a large administrative unit called Armenia was also formed as part of the Northern Viceroyalty of the Caliphate. It included the three former Sasanian Marspanates together with the adjacent Caspian regions up to Derbent, present-day southern Dagestan. It is interesting that while calling that entire huge area Armenia, the Arabs also made internal divisions, which mostly coincided with the former Sassanid Marspanate, Marspanate, but were called First Armenia, Second Armenia, Third Armenia, and Fourth Armenia. For example, the borders of the First Armenia uh, coincided with former Aram. <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, it is called Aram in uh, Persian way and Aram with double pronunciation in Arab, Arab way. This situation continued for another 200 years until independent states arose as a result of the disintegration of the Caliphate. The Bagratid Kingdom of Anishirak the, the Artruni Kingdom of Vaspurakan, the Kingdom of Sunik, the Kingdom of Tashir Doraget, and as others. At the same time, the Armenian Kingdom of Parisos was formed mostly in Utik. In the 10th century, the powerful principality of Hachen also emerged in Artsakh, which survived for several centuries. When the Seljuk invasions began, in the 11th century, Artsakh and Utik went different directions. Artsakh had much stronger positions because it was located in a deeper mountainous terrain. Uh, and there, the Armenian authorities maintained their positions in one way or another until the second half of the 18th century. And for that reason, Artsakh and especially its mountainous parts remained Armenian populated throughout that whole period. Meanwhile, the Ganzak or Ganja Emirate was created in Utik and the demographic picture changed here. Armenians gradually ceased to be the majority, although both in uh, Gan Ganzak, which had, this city had several names uh, afterwards, Ganja, Elizabeth Paul, uh, Kirovabad <coughs> and Kirovabad, and uh, finally once more Ganja. And the surrounding regions, despite all raids and emigrations, there was still a large Armenian population until 1988. During this same period, the Church of Arvand experienced its evolution as well. It is worth mentioning that as early as in the sixth century, the secular and spiritual centers of the Marspanate of Arvang were moved to the right bank of the Kura River, the city of Partav in Utik. Gradually, the name Arvang began to be used to a greater extent, not for Arvang proper, but for Artsakh and Utik region more frequently. The next, please. <clears throat> An important phase in the history of Artsakh or Karabakh was the period of the Melikdoms, which survived from the 17th to the 19th centuries, receiving a certain semi-independent status from the Iranian monarch and being called the Hamsa Five Melikdoms, which had internal autonomy, were independent in matters of tax collection and litigation, and each had the right to keep 1,000 soldiers for the protection of their principality. As a result of the first Russian-Persian War of 
1804-1813. And by the Treaty of Gulistan, both Artsakh and Utik became part of the Russian Empire. So we are speaking already about 19th century. Let me mention that around 200 manuscripts have come down to us from Artsakh and Utik, most of which are housed in the Mesrop Mashtot Matanadara. Maybe 90% of it are in Matanadara. The colophons of these manuscripts and the inscriptions preserved on the walls of the monasteries, together with the records of the historians, provide a wealth of information about the hundreds of monasteries, churches, and settlements spread throughout the vast territory between Kura and Araxes rivers, where these same manuscripts were created, as well as many others which have not survived. The book also includes those manuscripts that were produced in other places of Armenia, but were kept in the monasteries of Artsakh and Tutik and thus were saved from destruction. I think that the task of preserving Artsakh's cultural heritage will be much easier if every academic center or institute publishes at least one such book covering various fields, archeology, span architecture, monumental and de decorative art, carpet, folklore, and so on. I should also mention that we aim to publish the same book in French and Russian, maybe also in Persian, as well as conduct research and publish similar album books dedicated to the Armenian manuscript heritage of Nakhichevan. Uh, I would like you to show the map of the scriptoria. Here it is. Uh, you see how many they are. And it is really a, a huge territory between the two rivers, between Kura and Araxes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tergamondian. Uh, let me stop sharing. Did you hear everything? It yes. Clear? Yeah. Yes, very good. Okay. Am I visible? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't see myself for some reason. Never mind. That doesn't matter. I don't need to see myself. Uh, thank you so much for the, for your for presentation and and for uh, covering uh, a, a lot of material in in a succinct fashion. A uh, couple of questions, and again, I uh, in, want to invite the members of the audience to submit questions using the Zoom. Q&A at, at the bottom of your screen. Um, regarding historical sources on uh, the region of Utik, people are probably in this audience well familiar with many of the sources on, on Artsakh, perhaps less so with Utik. How do we know what we know about the region of uh, Utik? What are the sources? Um, look, uh, both for Artsakh and Utik regions, uh, for both of these regions, both of, both of these provinces, the main and the most important historical source is Moses Gagan Katvatsi. This is Patmutyun Agvanitz Ashkari. According to um, our uh, scholars, uh, first of all, Alexan Hakupian and some other scholars, uh, they, they had done much investigations uh, during the last 30, 40 years. It is considered that uh, this uh, historical work was, uh, started, uh, was started, in seven, uh, started in seventh century by Moses Garankat and was 
uh, added and completed in the 10th century by another Moses, Moses Das Kurans. So uh, from 7th to 10th century, this historical war work was uh, composed and it is considered as the main source, not only for Artsakh and Udik, but also for Agwank um, proper, I mean, Alba, Caucasian Albanians. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes the people, uh, here I want to say something also very important that uh, the English translation uh, was done in 19, was uh, published in London in 1961. Uh, it was done by a prominent armenologist, uh, Charles Dawson. Uh, but it was, the translation was uh, made not from the critical text, but from the publications that were uh, at that, that period, because the, the critical text appeared uh, 17 years after the English translation uh, was published. So uh, until now, we have no uh, an, uh, translate, uh, translation into English from the critical Armenian text of Patmutun uh, uh, But what is interesting that uh, I don't know why, uh, unfortunately, uh, many years ago, this scholar passed away and we, can, we can't ask him why. <laughs> But uh, there is a contradiction within the book, within this English translation. But uh, it, it could be not so important if it was uh, not the title itself of the book. Now, uh, I, will, I hope some of our <laughs> attendants understand Armenian. So <clears throat> I will say what, what is the, the, the problem. The book is called Patmutyun Agvanitz Ashkari, which can be translated as history of the land of Agvank, or simply the history of Agvank. But uh, if you take this book, you will see the title, The History of Caucasian Albanians, with S at the end. What does it mean? So the book is written about a country not about an ethnicity. But when you say history of Caucasian Albanians, it means that all you are telling in that book are about one ethnicity, which, which is not Ar <laughs> this is not Armenians, I'm sorry. But the same scholar in his introduction, you know that introduction is uh, situated in the beginning of the book, but usually is written when all the all the work is over, yes. so it, maybe it was done at the end of the work. Uh, in the introduction, it is translated as history of Alwang or Alwang, like this history of Alwang, which means that um, the scholar understood uh, finally what is the exact way. But I don't know why he didn't change <laughs> the whole book. Uh, in, in that way, so that the, the title will be more correct. This is something very important because uh, the, the, the problem is, the, is uh, in, in, the, in, in the following. Uh, when we say Hayots Pat Mutyun, yes, how do you translate it? How can you translate the Hayots Pat Mutyun? History of the Armenians. Uh, this is one. This, this is this is exactly the way is now um, more. I mean, uh, popular. But uh, in that uh, period, especially be, uh, before 11th century or even earlier, uh, it is understood as history of Armenia. Hmm. You see, because it is the uh, from the word Haik Hayot. You see, Hay Haik Hayastan. So. Uh, this is the same is the case for Arvanitz. When uh, you see the expression Arvanitz Ishan, Arvanitz Takavur, Arvanitz Katorikos, it doesn't mean necessarily that this is uh, an uh, uh, Albanian king, Arbe Albanian uh, prince, or Albanian Catholicos. It is Catholicos of Albania, prince of Albania, or king of Albania. This is a completely different thing. 
the, uh, and especially when we speak about the big, larger, or greater Aran or Albania or Arban, which is uh, 70, uh, from the very beginning is already uh, by its 70% of population is Armenian. So <laughs> there is a contradiction here. So it, uh, when you use these words in Armenian, it's okay. But when you have to translate them, so you are uh, compiled, you, you have to choose uh, either this one or that one, okay? <laughs> it's an interesting point. And I, I, of course, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Dowsett is no longer with us to, to answer these questions, <clears throat> but uh, we, we were left to, to ponder the point. Uh, question about, uh, shifting topics slightly, but the, the Artsakh Matanadaran, uh, what is its current situation, current function, and uh, future status? Oh, it's a huge question. It's difficult to answer. Answer any portion of it that you feel yeah, capable yeah. of. Well, uh, it is really multifunctional what we do. Uh, it is, first of all, uh, uh, keeping, preserving our national heritage because uh, Matanadan is the biggest, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the place where uh, almost half of the Armenian uh, manuscript uh, preserved until now are kept. Uh, of course, uh, then comes uh, investigation, research. We have uh, a whole, we can say that within Matanadan we have uh, an institute of research of about 120 uh, scholars. Uh, and we, uh, every year we publish about uh, at least uh, 20 monographs or, you know, um, important investigation, not, not to speak about many uh, articles published uh, in Armenia and in abroad. And of course, uh, Another important uh, field of activities, this is the, uh, the part of the museum, which uh, receives every year thousands of you know, uh, visitors. I can tell you uh, such a number that before uh, COVID uh, in 2019, we had uh, a number of 132,000 visitors per year. Uh, now we try to... <laughs> Again, this uh, you know numbers, but uh, until now we are uh, uh, we are not very close to that. Yeah, but uh, I hope uh, we will reach the same numbers very soon. So uh, this is a this this is a very multifunctional institution. So t tell me then the the situation with the Artsakh branch. Yeah, the Artsakh branch was uh, founded in uh, seven years ago, about seven years ago, in uh, 2015. Uh, and uh, its purpose was uh, to, uh, to, to have uh, more or less uh, the same kind of institution that is from, from one side, it is a museum, but uh, at the same time, it is a research center. Uh, we managed to have a, uh, a good museum, but uh, for what concerns the research center, uh, we didn't have much time to really create a, a research center there. Though we had already an important library, we had some facilities uh, on the place. But what concerns the museum, it had also uh, excellent, you know, I mean, their numbers of the visitors were uh, sometimes the uh, best the best among uh, Artsakh museums. So it was a very good result. Uh, for, for example, uh, 20,000 per year for Artsakh, it is a very huge number. Uh, and uh, also we started there to organize book presentations and what is very also important, we organized some uh, conferences, including an international one in 2019 and it was really a success because we had uh, scholars from different centers, European centers, important scholars from Germany, Italy, England, uh, Belgium, uh, Holland, 
but uh, and, and we were very enthusiastic thinking that uh, we will every year it will be i mean uh, annually organized uh, conference and uh, we didn't know that in a year we will have a quarter and the, but, the, the... And, and so, sorry sorry i i want uh, uh, to, to, to complete uh, during the war we uh, we took all the uh, by the way the uh, manuscripts uh, exposed there were those uh, which were uh, i mean uh, created on the place sometimes in ganzasar or in uh, dadivan or in amaras in different churches of artsakh and uh, when the war started we were of course very much um, worried about their fate and uh, during the war, it was at the end of October and beginning of November, we organized the evacuation of all this. We, we took all these uh, exponents to Yerevan completely. But uh, once the war was over, uh, after about six months, we took half of them, half of them there. And now we have the exposition. The museum is open. We have visitors there, but the exposition is more or less the half that was before. And now we uh, are thinking about to uh, make it 100% as it was before the war uh, up to the end of this year. I see, thank you. Um, I know you're a historian and so <laughs> therefore all these questions uh, are, are nonetheless not necessarily historical questions. This is a question about the, the Udi population today. Uh, what is known about their relationship to the historical Caucasian Albanians? And what, my impression, I'm, I'm, I'm improvising here, but my impression is that the, the uh, official Azerbaijan's interest in the Udi population is a relatively new phenomenon, uh, and that formerly they were not seen as being quite so useful as, as they are currently viewed as. Can, can you comment anything on the recent history of, of the Udi people? Uh, yes, I'm a historian, but I'm not a historian of uh, this uh, uh, issue, but uh, I will try to say what, uh, as far as I know. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Udi's, uh, according to, the language that they speak uh, is considered as uh, more close, close to, uh, of course, it, it is a Caucasian language, and it is closer to so-called Nahian Dagestanian group of Caucasian family of languages, which is uh, uh, even closer to one of these languages, Les uh, the language that the Lesgin, the Lesgins speak. Lesgin. Uh, nation. Uh, what concerns their, uh, their locations, uh, their settlements? Uh, they, they, uh, there were some Udis in in the historical uh, Utik, uh, not far from uh, Ganja, so Ganzak. Uh, but uh, there, there were never. Uh, any Udi's uh, villages or Udi's, uh, no, not a single, I mean, maybe not a single family even in Artsakh region. So in Utik there were, but in Artsakh, no, never. Uh, what concerns the church? Uh, I'm telling what I have heard about with some conversations with uh, Parkev, Sir Pazan, with Archbishop Parkev and other. Uh, or, uh, or scholars, Alexander Atopian and others. Uh, why I'm <laughs> giving his name because uh, Arkev, Archbishop is uh, uh, from uh, Chardaklu village, which is <laughs> also from Utik yes, mm. region. Uh, and they told me that uh, historically, I mean, his, or speaking about 20th century, Udis, Udis, uh, had had no their own church. They were going always uh, to Armenian church churches, to Armenian churches. Uh, whenever there there was an Armenian church or in Ganja or in other uh, places in, in their 
close region. Uh, and what is now very uh, important that nowadays these Udis who are maybe, I don't know the number of them, maybe, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000, no more, uh, especially in Azerbaijan. They, in fact, they are, there are hostages of Azerbaijani government. Simply, they are hostages of that government, and uh, they uh, can't. They, they have to simply uh, do what uh, they are told to do. So, uh, and the Azerbaijani authorities uh, try to obtain some kind of status or create from from zero uh, a new church. Yes, a new church, but they can't do it without uh, the help or without the. Um, authorization of uh, Greek patriarch of Constantinople or Pope of Rome. Until now, they uh, have no success in that direction, but it doesn't mean that we have to be very, you know, uh, we, we have to be very, very careful in that issue because once they uh, will have their own church, it will be even much, it will be even more difficult to protect our churches, especially those which are on the border or out of the border of Artsakh right now. For example, uh, the case of Dadivan is very delicate case, very, yeah. very delicate, or Amaras also. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, is there any difference between the chapters in the current volume by Haravar Hakopian uh, and the 1989 edition of the book of the same title by Haravar Hakopian. Is, uh, are these yeah. new writings or are they reprints? In fact, in fact, uh, in the case of Tamara Minasyan and uh, Ravar Hakopian, uh, you know that uh, each uh, scholar has at least two or three uh, monographs concerning these issues. So uh, they themselves had uh, made, uh, uh, let, let's just say, um, uh, summarized or uh, made, um, uh, pro um, re uh, rewrote what they have written until now, but we can't say that these are completely new investigations. It is based on what they have done uh, last 30 years or 20 years. And in the case of uh, the first part, uh, the historical part that Vahe Torosian has written, uh, he has written also based on uh, the, what the other scholars, uh, including Alexander Akopian or others, had, had written the uh, last 30 or 40 years. So uh, as I told from the beginning, our purpose was to all this, uh, make the, this, uh, all these academic uh, works, all these researches of, I don't know, 400, 500 pages and so on, uh, possible to uh, put in one book, which will be much easier to read and will be, uh, I mean, readable, not only for uh, uh, academic circles, but also for politicians, diplomats, and uh, simple people. It's complicated history, uh, even for people who are conversant with the history, it's still complicated. And, and I wonder, uh, I, this isn't really a question, uh, but if you ever feel the frustration of trying to uh, put exceedingly complicated history into simple terms that, that could have an impact on people in position to create policy. Well, as uh... At least for the people who are honest, who have no other interests, you know, uh, it, it will have its impact. Uh, for, for those who have uh, some uh, personal interests, uh, nothing can help. <laughs> I, I won't ask you to name names. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a question from a gentleman in the audience. This is not related to the topic specifically, nevertheless. Uh, he writes that he has a manuscript in his family collection that is believed to be from the 17th century. Is there someone at the Matanadran th that he could contact with with an inquiry of, uh, with inquiries related to this? Uh, of course. I, 
he can send the inquiry to me. And if you will tell me separately whom I should direct it to, then, then I'd be very happy to help this, this person okay. out. Okay. Of course, with pleasure. Great. Uh, and then the last uh, point is not a question, but a comment from a member of the audience, Christina Maranzi, and it's nice, so I want to read it out loud. Uh, bravo to the Matanadran and to Nasser for this wonderful work. I'm excited to buy the book. I think the idea of each center publishing a book on Artsakh and Nakhchivan is excellent. Thank you all so much. I, I underscore those sentiments. And uh, lastly, I would just like to ask either or both of you briefly to tell us a little bit about uh, other major upcoming Matanadaran projects and or publications, if, if you wish to share uh, in short. Yeah, uh, one of our uh, most important uh, coming events is, uh, uh, in fact, the year, the coming year, 2023, is the year uh, which is included in the list of UNESCO, uh, you know, uh, Jubilee and uh, list. Uh, this, this is uh, 850 years of, uh, of the year of the death of um, our uh, uh, great uh, Catholicos, Nersa Shnurali of 12th century, uh, the, the great poet and theologian and, you know, uh, uh, great ecumenic also <laughs> figure. Uh, so, uh, dedicated to Nersa Shnurali, we are going to uh, uh, do the following, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the following. First of all, we are going to publish uh, the 22nd uh, volume of Matenagi Kayots, uh, which, is, which will be uh, the second half of Nersa Shnurali, uh, uh, all the... Uh, uh, literary uh, heritage of Nersesh Nurali, which uh, will be completed with uh, publishing that volume. Uh, the next is uh, organizing uh, uh, a conference, an international conference dedicated to Shnurali, which will uh, take place uh, in the coming year in June, in June 2023, and also an uh, exposition of uh, manuscripts. Uh, Nersesh Nurali manuscript in Matenadaran, which will take place starting from the beginning of the uh, coming year and will be uh, working, it will be open during the whole year. <clears throat> this is what uh, we, we are going to do next year, but we are preparing starting from now. Fantastic. Look forward to that. Uh, we look forward to future collaborations between our uh, institutions. And uh, thank you, Dr. Tevavonian, Sona, thank and you. everybody uh, at the Matanadaran for the fantastic work you are doing uh, day in and day out. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you very much. Have a great See you evening. Bye-bye. See you later.